Here's an episode of How to Analyse Poetry from the Learning Cauldron. Today, we'll be looking at Edwin Morgan's poem, In the Snack Bar. Analyzing poetry involves identifying and dissecting the literary techniques that the poet uses effectively to explore the theme or themes of a poem. In his poem, In the Snack Bar, Edwin Morgan explores the themes of the plight of less fortunate people, the elderly, disabled, or the vulnerable, how society treats these people, human connections, and religion. The title of the poem, In the Snack Bar immediately establishes the setting and also reflects the fact that a lot of Edwin Morgan's poems are inspired by ordinary people and places. Morgan uses acute skills of observation and he starts by referencing the fact that a cup capsizes along the formica, which is the surface of the table, slithering with a dull clatter. So we've got excellent use of sound here, the alliteration of cup capsizes and then the onomatopoetic clatter. What is interesting, and it's one of the observations that he makes in the poem, is that although the snack bar is crowded, only a few heads turn. And this is reflective of the fact that society ignores the plight of this poor man. We see how difficult life is for him because words such as levers tell us that everything is an effort for him. His hands have no power. We are also made to feel pity for him because of the fact that his humpback is referred to as the dismal hump. And the word choice of dismal suggests bleakness and a miserable existence, as does the word looming over him to describe it. It almost sounds like a threatening presence in itself. The use of imagery, the simile, like a monstrous animal caught in a tent, is very effective here. Just as a wild animal stuck inside a canvas tent would have its limbs bulging out through the fabric, so too the man in his gabardine, that's a jacket, has his limbs sticking out because of the fact that he is slightly deformed. This also, because of the use of the word choice monstrous animal, compares the man to a creature, not a human, and in so doing dehumanises him. The first reference to his being blind comes with the reference to the stick once painted white. So this word choice is important in establishing something significant about the man. The list, long blind, Hunchback born, half paralysed, shocks the reader. One person tolerating so many difficulties in their life and the fact that it is in a list, an asyndetic list with no connectives, makes that all the more powerful, evoking a tone of pity here. Uh, The reader feels terribly sorry for this man. We also feel sorry when we hear him start to speak. He needs to go to the toilet, something fairly basic and fundamental, but the hesitation in his voice could mean that he's embarrassed or it could just be that he is very inarticulate. I want pause to go to the pause toilet. We are beginning to feel extremely sorry for him. Moving on now to the second of the three stanzas. This stanza is extremely long. It's over 40 lines long. And during it, we follow the journey of the two men as the poet himself, the persona in the poem, takes the arm of the blind man and helps him down the stairs. There's a very blunt statement here, I take his arm, which immediately lets the reader know what's happening here. And we can see a growing connection. If we think back to the way that he described him initially, now he's taking his arm. There is a connection here, a human connection that's developing. The inch by inch, the repetition of the word inch, which is obviously a very small measurement, helps to convey the fact that progress is slow. It's taking them a long time to make this journey. And this is a fantastic image. A few yards of floor are like a landscape to be negotiated. The simile here compares the floor of the cafe to a whole landscape where there are obstacles which have to be got round in order to to safely traverse. If we move on, the obstacles that I just referred to, they come in many shapes and forms, and he uses all the senses here. We've got the onomatopoetic crunch and then the sibilant spilt sugar. And when someone is blind, their other senses often take over and become more powerful. So it's very effective to have the other senses brought into the equation here. Slidey puddle from the night's umbrellas, table edges, people's feet, this long list here of all the things Things that the blind man would have to on his own negotiate and this is why he's relying on the poet to help him across this. And again we see the use of sound here, the onomatopoeia of hiss of the coffee machine. Another sense is brought in, smell, the smell of a cigar, hamburgers, wet coats steaming, a very characteristic smell here. There's a very strong establishment of a sense of place and it all comes from the details that Morgan is very um, renowned for. And the word choice of dangerous reminds us how a stairway for someone blind 
mind could well pose a danger. There's another short sentence here, he clings to me. And once again, this is referring to the fact that there is a human connection developing between the poet and the blind man. The blind man is reliant on the poet at this point, and the idea of clings, it's very poignant, the picture that's created here. The repetition of the word slowly, and slowly we go down, and slowly we go down. In fact, it's not just the word slowly, it's the whole phrase, which emphasises the difficulty of this journey that they are undertaking together. And then when they reach the toilet, there's a lovely contrast, although I'm not sure lovely is a very lavatorial word, between the uncouth man, who's quite rough and ready, and the clinical gleam of the toilet. Then Morgan uses the assonant qualities of trickle, his, is, and thin to convey how difficult it is for the man to go to the toilet and to urinate. It is described, this process is described as an old man's apology for living, which is a very poignant statement. It's almost as if he has to apologize for doing what comes naturally, effectively. Painful ages, again, a reference to time. We've already had the reference of slowly up here, Time is something that Morgan looks at quite often in his poetry. The word choice here of feebly, again, makes us feel sorry for the man. And it is fairly evident that the poet himself is becoming more compassionate towards him compared to how he first viewed him. The word choice of gently shows us this. Here there's a human connection as he tries to help the man dry his hands in the roar, again, sound of the hot air. We're still in the second stanza, still on the journey to the loo and back again. And repetition is used as it was earlier. He climbs, he climbs, and then the pronoun changes to we climb, showing the connection here. He climbs again. We can see those two flights of steps slowly being climbed by the two men. And what the poet comments on here is the persisting patience, emphasised by the alliteration of P's, of the undefeated, which is the nature of man. He's looking at the resilience of mankind. Here is a man who has so much going against him, and yet he keeps going. It may be slow, the progress, but he does keep going. And re repeat it again, slowly we go up, slowly we go up. So structure is being used here to help us follow this path that they take up the stairs. There's slight contradiction here, which creates a tone of uncertainty, faltering, unfaltering, endless, yet not endless. And the endless waste is a nice image here again of the floor that the man has to cross. And we know from before that there were many obstacles there for him to negotiate. When the man gets on a bus and the poet is watching him, the poet comments that the bus shudders off in the rain. And that word choice, it's almost as if the bus is somehow mimicking the unsteady progress and the unsteady movement of the blind man. Moving on to the third and final stanza now, the word choice of dark here reminds us that no matter what the blind man does, he will always be in darkness because of being blind. And here there's the assonance of must, trust, but also the alliteration of must and men, which focuses the reader's eyes on these three words. This man is vulnerable. He has to rely on other people in order to help him do things that the rest of us take for granted. And we've got a repetition here, he must, so we can see the essential nature of his reliance on other people. Most pitiful needs. Again, we're being made to feel sorry and extreme sympathy for this man and all the things that he has to face in life. The short sentence, no one sees his face, is very blunt. And it draws our attention to an interesting fact. It says that no one sees his face. He is the person who is blind. And yet it is implying here that society is equally blind to his needs as they have not rushed to help him. The word choice of frightening is interesting because it refers back in some ways to the image earlier on about the, the monstrous creature in the tent. And the poet is pointing out the fact that perhaps society are put off by his appearance and that that makes them uneasy and that he, the man has no idea that he is perhaps so off-putting to society. Mountainous coat, again a reference back to that gabardine from earlier on. And this imagery is very powerful. His hands like wet leaves stuck to the half-white stick. So just as wet leaves stick onto things and are sort of clammy, his hands are grabbing onto his essential white stick that proclaims to society that he is blind. The word choice of evade here 
which means to dodge or keep away from something, reminds us that society tries to stay out of his way. They ignore him. And then we're reminded again of his physical deformity and of the difficulties that he faces in his life to haul his blind hump. And we have a transferred epithet here. The man is blind, but he's also humpbacked. And so the adjective blind is being applied to the hump and that really focuses our attention on his difficulties. The last line of the poem is very powerful. It's, it's almost despair, a combination of despair, frustration, maybe anger, and certainly pity. As the poet announces, dear Christ, and we know he's an atheist, to be born for this. And this is an exclamatory remark, and it just sums up the feelings that he now has when he looks at the man and his situation in a society that does not care. I hope that's been helpful. See you next time.